Okay, boys and girls, we're going to get it started. I hope you had a good weekend, all of you. And as you know, this is the last of the classes. Um, we are going to move on. We're now going to move on to something else. Uh, I was thinking of doing um, the uh, diary of a wimpy kid. I might do a diary of a wimpy kid for next class. I will let you know. I hope you join. It's not going to be a free class, though, unfortunately. Um, there will be a charge. And, but I, I still hope you join. Uh, the uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid is really funny. It's, uh, it's funny. It's uh, uh, mocking, you know, the certain age that, uh, that the wimpy, wimpy Kid was in. Um, so it, it makes, uh, uh, makes it like into a satire, which is making fun. Um, it's really fun. Now, I'm probably going to do two books, Diary of a Wimpy Kid and something else. I'm not really quite sure, but I do hope you join. Um, I try to give you in-depth analysis of each of the books that I do, and we try to do it in a fun way. So hopefully I will see you there. I will see you next time. Anyway, we left here last time, class seven. This is class eight. Um, and we're gonna try to finish off today. We're gonna do a few slides and then we're gonna do some of the quotations um, from the book. I'm gonna read the quotations and I will read the analysis of the quotations. Please jump in and say whatever you want to say, uh, especially being that this is the last class. So if you have any comments, if you have anything to add, you know, please uh, feel free to do it. Don't worry, just you can write it on the, on the chat or you can just talk it. Um, when's your next class? Um, I ha we haven't done it yet. We, in other words, we haven't uh, set the schedule yet, but let me see, let me look at my calendar so that I can give you an idea. Uh, let me see, today is the 9th of February and uh, it would probably be either towards the end of February, maybe like starting on the 23rd of February, probably around there, because that'll give me, you know, two or three weeks to prepare the PowerPoints. I already have the diary of a wimpy kid. I have those PowerPoints done, but the second book, I, I have to do the, the PowerPoints. And that usually takes me a little while. You know, it takes me about a week, more or less a week and a half uh, to put them together. I try to, I try to do, you know, I try to put a lot of stuff into them. Uh, I don't just give you, you know, a couple of pictures and stuff like that. I try to put as much as I can into it to make it interesting, make it fun for you guys. So, so it takes me about a week. It usually takes me about a week, sometimes a week and a half. But, I, but at least the good thing is that I already have Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I already have that in PowerPoint. I need to pick a, another book and I need to do the PowerPoint for that other book. I'm not quite sure yet which one I want to do. I could do um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid 1 because it's a whole series of wimpy kids. Uh, and I can do the number two volume, maybe, I don't know yet. Um, I have to read it. I don't, I don't wanna do something 
that then it becomes boring. You know, you already read the diary of a wimpy kid and then you're going to read the second one, which is similar. I want to make sure that they're different enough in case I do that. But I will let you know. We will definitely let you know. Anyway, so um, again, as I say, if you want to add anything to the conversation, please, please um, feel free to do it. Don't, don't be embarrassed. Um, so technology. You know, did we do this already? It seems like we did this. Yeah, already. we already did. We already did this, right? So I think it's because, oh, I remember now what happened. We canceled the first class. I remember not too many, there's only one student that came to the first class and then, and we canceled it. So I'm, I was running a little bit ahead. So we did all the way to quotes, I think, right? So we have to do the quotes now. That's the one part that we're going to do. I think I did the first quote. And, uh, and now I have to do all of those quotes. So why don't we do that? Why don't we do the quotes? And let's talk about it. Um, rats of Nim, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, is it's kind of an interesting book. It's kind of an interesting book because a lot of people say that it's not just a book about um, animals that have got the ability to speak like we see so many books about animals that have the ability to speak and to think and stuff like that, uh, especially books that are children's books. But it's, it is almost like a science fiction, right? Don't you think that it's kind of like a science fiction in a way because it, uh, it deals with science. It deals with a laboratory that develops some kind of drug that, uh, that they give, they inject, or they give to the rats, and then it makes the rats smarter. And then the rats kind of pick up a community of their own. Um, and that reminds me, I don't know if you, if you guys, you know, and since we're at the last day of class, we can experiment a little bit here and we can do other things. But that kind of reminds me of a movie uh, called uh, Planet of the Apes. Did anybody ever watch that movie, The Planet of the Apes? You already told us about this. I already told you about the Planet of the Apes, right? Um, kind of reminds me of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to show you a couple of the clips. Yeah, one ape is, well, all the apes are very smart, actually. Um, they, they speak, they, the apes create a, a world, actually. They create a world. Um, and uh, some apes become military apes. You know, they wear uniforms and they carry guns. Other apes are doctors and they heal apes. You know, they, they have uh, clinics and hospitals and stuff like that. Other apes are teachers and they teach other apes. Um, they have all of the careers that we humans have the apes have. Now, this movie is a serious movie. This is not necessarily a children's movie. Um, it's not, was not written uh, for kids, even though kids watch it. My children, when they were young, when they were like 10, I think, 10 or 12, they watched the movie and they were like, oh my gosh, this is crazy, right? Um, so I think that almost anybody can watch the movie, but it has a serious subject. Um, it, it has a, a very serious subject with some deep uh, philosophical arguments or philosophical um, discussions. For instance, should animals 
be experimented with. Um, do animals have the capability of learning, of improving themselves, right? Um, so a lot of that stuff kind of goes into the, uh, uh, this movie. So let's, let's just watch, let's see if it's on YouTube. I don't know if it is actually. Um, Planets of the Apes. Hopefully it is. A lot of times they want to charge you. So maybe, maybe, maybe full movie. Yeah, there you go. There's a full movie. And then there, and there's been many of them. This one here was made in 1968. You know, a long time ago. This one was made in 2001. Let's go with the 2001 and see what uh, that could be a little bit more better, better film anyway, right? And, and the idea is that these astronauts, they get on a, on a rocket and they go up in space. And they land on this planet <clears throat> and the planet is run by the apes however however uh they don't know whether it's that they went around the universe and came back whether it is indeed a different planet from the earth kind of you know it could be considered a little, a little scary in a way experimenting on eight to show them how to fly a, a rocket to this eight is doing. Yes, uh, that they lose track of the eight. Yeah, in a way they did. Not the, but all the eight. You see, the, the, the laboratory is full of eights. And they take the eights and they dress them up like a like a uh, an astronaut. And they try to teach the ape how to, how to fly the plane. We all know it's just rocket and later. We're actual boyfriend. The voice is not very good. Yeah, the, you know what, uh, when you frustrate them, they lose focus, they get confused. Let's, let's that bang for the little bit. Now, flying the plane. Or flying the, the rocket. The, uh, attaches into, into a wall. He's right there, he's crashing into a wall. like the lower species and the upper species are the monkeys 
So it's kind of the reverse, right? Here, the humans are the higher species and the monkeys are kind of the lower species. Oh, wait, when they fly into the planet, do the apes control the... Yes, the apes control the humans. Like the apes rule the place because I have heard of this movie before. Yes, you're totally correct. The apes run the show and the humans are below the apes. Now, the quality of the movie is not good. Um, sometimes in YouTube, you get a little lousy quality. Maybe we can look at the one that's the older one. But anyway, now he's running through the woods, and now he's going to encounter his... Yeah. So he finds humans, and the humans are running. That's because the place of the apes. The apes want to catch them and put them inside of a zoo. Apes are hunting, yes. They're hunting the humans. Oh my God. Now they're going to take him. I guess they're going to take him like to a zoo or something. Look at the apes dressed up with helmets and uniforms. And they, speak. they have the capability of speaking. Now, this is really bad. They, I think they're going to take them to a zoo. Yeah, let's let's look at this one. This one is the older one, the one from 1968. Um, but I think. Probably the quality of this one is, is a little bit better. This one's got this actor, his name was uh, Charleston Heston. And uh, I don't know what's going on. Quality is also not great. The voice is terrible. In this movie, it wasn't just one astronaut. There were several astronauts. And they landed here on this uh, particular world. Guys, they're lost. Let me see. Let's advance it. Would you? 
Here they are. Now they see they put them kind of like they're experimenting on the humans. They caught them. You see, they. The problem is that this stupid movie, the quality is so bad. Let me see if I can get one that quality is a little bit better. Um, Final of the Apes, Battle for the Final of the Apes. Here's another one, 217. Maybe this one's a little bit better. They made a whole bunch of these. Is there a copy? See, in this movie, they're using apes in war. They taught them how to fight. But then the apes continue to, uh, to evolve in this particular one. Oh, uh, different teams or you know, different stops. But they're, it's all, always the same. The apes, they learn to speak. They learn to think. They learn to problem. At first, they speak in languages and uh, language, which you know they have already done that. There, there used to be a, an ape, a gorilla by the name of Coco. He was a real gorilla, and, uh, and she died recently. But she learned how to speak in sign language, like the deaf people. I know, maybe, maybe I, you. I know, I know that a or gorilla. Coco the ape. Yes. Was it was it Coco a silverback or something? Uh, what? Wasn't silver? I mean, wasn't Coco a silverback? No, uh, Coco was a sil yeah, but the silverback are the uh, the males. She was uh, Coco the ape. Um. Coco the ape sign language. Um, she, you know, she right. She was silverback, but but silverbacks are are uh, they call silverbacks the males. The females are not called silverbacks, but it's the same type of uh, ape. You know, it's the same type of ape. Let me see. Uh, Co uh, watch Coco the gorilla use sign language in this 1985 film. National Geographic. Okay, let's watch. Wait, have you heard of the one and only Ivan? Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Have I heard of what? Have you heard of the one and only Ivan? The 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 which? The one and only Ivan. Oh no! Never heard of him. No. Of the one and only Ivan. No. No, I've never heard of them. I got to look them up. Now, this is real. Yes, this is real, Alan. This, this, this female. Um, oh, it's really a good book. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I've heard of it. The one and only Ivan. Yes, yes. You know, that could be a possibility for us to do next time. Let me see. The one and only Ivan. Wow. I'm glad you, I'm glad I'm talking to you guys. Let me see. Because you're going to give me some ideas. The one and only. Um, I, I think the one and only Ivan is by the same author as the Wish, Wish Tree book. I see. Okay, let me see. Let me see. The one and only Ivan. The one and only Ivan, the one and only Ivan, the only one and only, only Ivan is a 2012 novel written by Catherine Applegate and illustrated by Patricia Castellau. It is about a silverback gorilla named Ivan who lived in a cage at a mall and it's written from Ivan's point of view. Whoa, really? This sounds really interesting. And then there's another book called The One and Only Bob, which is from another character's point of view. From another character's point of view. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about this one. Maybe, maybe we do this one. I don't know what the, uh, what the age uh, 
I just have to see what the age, let's see, age for the one and only Ivan. Okay, hey, here's something. We, we, I might do this one. I might, uh, it says that it's uh, for children that are between the ages of eight and 12. So this could be a possibility. Man, am I glad you told me this. This is pretty awesome. This is really, really awesome. I'm gonna look into it and see if it's something that we can do. So maybe we can do um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid and do the one and only Ivan. And then the other one that you're saying is the one and only Bob, right? Is that what you said? Um, maybe we can do that one too. The one and only Ivan is very good. A sequel, I'm reading The Martian right now. Uh, it's a school project. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right. Anyway, so let's look here and we're going to see Coco, who was a real gorilla. old and she died. Near San Francisco, California, a fascinating and now controversial experiment has been underway since 1972. Sure. Research psychologist Penny Patterson is teaching lowland gorilla Coco the American sign language of the deaf. Dr. Patterson claims Coco has a working vocabulary of about 450 signs, and that because Patterson also talks while signing, Coco understands hundreds of spoken words as well. And down from the tree now, you've had five green <laughs> For many years, researchers have been fascinated with the language possibilities in chimpanzees. Patterson is the first to work with gorillas. In Coco's okay. mobile home, not far from yeah, Patterson's yeah. house, even breakfast is a time for work. Should I pour there? All right. This is hot. You stir, Coco? It needs to be stirred. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, now try it. Michael. In an adjoining room of the trailer, a trainer works with seven-year-old Michael. Dickel? All right, where? Where, underarm? It is hoped that one day he and Coco will mate. <laughs> okay. Can you find something soft? Coco? Can you find something soft? Is there something soft here? Yes, that's soft. That? Yes, I feel it. It's nice. What color is that? Oh, yes, it's orange. Oh, very smart. Good apple. Okay, but first, let's look at something. Let's get a new one. Take that one out. Let's see. Which one would you like to look at, Coco? We have three new ones. Which one? The monkeys. Okay, the monkeys. Monkeys, all right. Oh, my God. Let's see. I'll get them out. Okay, here. Let's change. One, change them. Okay, finish that one. Can you tell me about what you see? Can you tell me a little about that? What do you see? Margie, trouble! Wait a minute. I've got to see if there's someone in here that looks like Margie. Just a minute. Well, there's a monkey swimming on this one. Just, to, just be patient. Be patient. I have to look. Penny wants to. Penny wants to look. I guess he was anybody like Margie. Somehow. Well, there's a girl that looks like Margie. Yes, there's a girl feeding a monkey, and she looks a bit like Margie. Now, what's wrong here? Is there anything wrong? 
With reading readiness tests used with human children, Patterson tests Coco's grasp of concepts. Yes, that, good. And then you say the tree? Well, you showed me the trees and that was wrong, right. Anything else wrong? Anything else wrong? Hmm? Yes, they have that, the lady and the tiger. Oh, that is a bit weird. Wow. Look at, this. look at these. These are pretty neat. Coco, look. There are stars. Can you find the eyes in this picture? Right. Those are the eyes. Oh my God. Critics of okay. ape language studies claim that the animals are not creating true language, that it is merely mimicry or responses evoked by inadvertent cues. Patterson is quick to point out that Coco often signs to herself. In this case, several repetitions of flower and hat. Clearly, Patterson says, something more complex than mimicry is involved in the mental capacities Coco displays. Okay, no, Coco, I asked you to stay over here. Perhaps criticism will abate as apes begin to sign to each other. Patterson reports instances of this between Coco and Mike and hopes they will eventually pass on their abilities to their offspring. But work aside at day's end, there is time now just for fun. today because it's hot more I think you need more more water okay that's enough linguists and philosophers argue the definition of language and whether it is uniquely human in academic okay. corridors the debate will go on but for now, few can deny we have glimpsed a mind more fascinating than ever imagined before. You look tired. Oh, dear. A pretty drawing ruined by a gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. By knowing more about gorillas, about their intelligence, how sensitive they are, how perceptive they are, we can hope to convey the importance of saving gorillas as a species to people who are living with them and are competing with them. Um, if they realize how similar to man they are, perhaps conservation efforts will be enhanced. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing, guys. This is so amazing. Anyway, so here we go. The rats of Nim. Who could say, right? So the rats of Nim, a science fiction. How often have we seen science fiction that becomes reality, right? Uh, if you ever watched uh, Star Trek, the first Star Trek shows showed a cellular phone, kind of like a mobile phone, right? They had the communicators that they would open them up like this and they would talk. Back then, back in the 60s, there were no such gadget. But then we created one. Now we talk on, on a cellular phone, on a communicator. So science fiction sometimes foretells the future, predicts the future, gives us a glimpse, a, a glimpse into the future. So who's to say? Maybe one day we'll be talking to rats. What do you think? Do you think we will ever talk to rats? Do you think we will ever talk to dogs, to cats? Do you think cats will ever come together and create Maybe a little city or a little town. Maybe, I mean, really, 
how far could this go? So this book is uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, you know, cats are lazy. Uh, they sit around all day and eat. That's right. They sleep and they eat. I got three cats. And I got one cat in particular that sleeps half the day. Boomer. He Sometimes he comes over here. You see him behind me. He's the black one with a white, uh, with a white markings, right? Um, and he he sits around all day long. Now your cat, uh, Trinity. You you say you have a cat. He does not. He doesn't lay around. He he kind of walks around a little bit more. Mine is very lazy. Mine is very lazy. Now, excuse me. Mine. Sorry. Mine is indoor, outdoor. He comes inside, he eats, goes to sleep, and then he'll ask to go out. So I have to let him out. I open up the door, he goes outside, and he walks around a little bit, then he comes back in. And then when he comes back, he doesn't just sit around that much. He goes to sleep, and he sleeps most of the day. But imagine if we could eventually train or allow certain animals to evolve to a point where they can talk, they can plan, they can maybe help us out, right? Help us out to do things. Um, so it's really very interesting. Very, very interesting. Anyway, so let's, let's go to the quotes. Let's read some of the quotes. And, uh, and in fact, I'm thinking that maybe, maybe, I don't know if you guys are willing, maybe some volunteers would like to read for me. My cat is my profile pic. Ah, really? <laughs> That's funny. All right. So I don't know. Maybe some of you guys would like to practice your reading a little bit and read some of these quotes for us. Ah, he's so proud in this picture. <laughs> Leo, I can read. Okay, there you go, Leo. You, you be the first one. Let me, give me a second. I have to make this bigger. Let me see, I don't know how to do it. That's too big. Hold on. Let me fix this. Okay. So I think last time we read the first one, they were teaching us to read. So let's move on to the next quote. And the next quote is right here. The top line of black marks on the wall were instantly familiar. All right, so who volunteered? Leo. Okay, Leo, go ahead and read from over here. The top line, go ahead. The top line of black marks on the wall was instantly from, were instantly familiar. R-A-T-S. As soon as I saw them, I thought of the picture that went with them. And as soon as I did that, I, and, and as soon as I did that, I was, for the first time, reading. Because, of course, that's what reading is. Using pictures to suggest an image or idea. Okay. I read the translation, the, the interpretation, is this description of reading is pretty profound, if you ask Shmoop. Once we know how to read, we often take it for granted, right? We don't even think about it. We just do it. It becomes kind of like an automatic thing. But Nicodemus's world is so transformed by his ability to read that there is no way he'll forget what it was like. All right, who wants to do the next one? 
Any volunteers out there? Any volunteers? Go ahead, Leah. Why don't you do one more? Okay. About half an hour after they left that night, Justin said, I'm going to try now. I heard a scuffling noise, a click, and a scrape of metal. And in a matter of seconds, I saw the door swing open. It was as simple as that when you could read. Okay. Symbol alert. That nasty K symbolizes captivity. Know what sets Justin's free? His ability to read. So he's able to read it and he is able to figure out how to set himself free. Tasks that before would have been impossible now seem within reach to the rats, to the rats. Any other volunteers out there? Anyone else wants to? Well, thank you very much, Leo. That was great, great reading. You're a great reader. My goodness, you could, you could do my job. You could, I could give you the PowerPoint. You could teach the class. That, that's how well you read. That's pretty good. Okay, so I'll do it. Uh, by teaching us how to read, they had taught us how to get away. Oh, 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 that's right. This is pretty ironic because getting away is exactly what the name scientists do not want the rats to do with their knowledge. Total backfire. It totally backfired on them. In literature, having the ability to read is often associated with freedom. And this is no exception, right? We always say that reading sets you free. Why does reading sets you free? First of all, it sets you free intellectually, because now you can think about so many other different things, so many other different ideas, so many ways of solving problems. We would never know how to solve a problem unless we're able to read able to read someone else solving the problem, right? Maybe read about so possible solutions to the problem. So reading allows us to solve problems, but it also sets us free, not just from an intellectual perspective, but also from an entertainment perspective. We read a book, we read a novel and our mind flies away, right? Have you ever experienced that? Where you read a book and maybe you read a few pages and all of a sudden you realize that you're creating these images inside of your mind. The images of what the author is trying to tell you almost like a movie. In fact, you're beginning to see a movie in your mind. You're beginning to see a screen in your mind and the characters doing and talking and things happening. That's what happens when you're able to read. The people that are not able to read or don't read, you know, they don't read well, or they don't like to read, they don't experience that flight of freedom, that flight of fancy, they don't experience that. So reading, wow, how important is that? How important is that? This was a large rectangular room with walnut paneling, a walnut desk, leather chairs, and walls lined to the ceiling with books, thousands of books about every subject you could think of. There were shelves of paperbacks. There were encyclopedias, histories, novels, philosophies, and textbooks of physics, chemistry, electrical engineer, and others, more than I can name. Well, we fell on those books with even more appetite than on the food. And in the end, we moved into the house and stayed all winter. Have you ever described a room in 
this much detail. Put this down a little bit. Nicodemus describes the library with love and affection because it contains all the knowledge that they need. Most rats would probably set up shop in the kitchen or two holes in the books. It's starting to seem like these rats are more human than rat. Mm. But what I liked best was history. I read about the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans, and the Dark Ages, where the old civilizations fell apart, and the only people who could read and write were the monks. And that's true. You know, that is so true. Back in the Middle Ages, back, uh, you know, the Middle Ages started, eh, I don't know, about 700 AD. Uh, 700. So that would make it what, like 1500 years ago. And, uh, and it ended right at the cusp or at the beginning of the Renaissance. Uh, which many people say was around 1500. So it lasted, you know, quite a, quite a lot of centuries, maybe seven or eight uh, centuries. And a very small percentage of the population back in those days could read. The ones that were able to read were the Catholic monks. And that's because when they entered religious school, seminary, they called it back then seminary, they needed to read the Bible. So they had to learn to read. And a lot of the monks also were involved in rewriting the Bible. Back in those days, there were no printing presses. Right? Today, we have a big machine that prints books and prints papers and prints uh, magazines and things like that. But back in those days, the printing press had not been invented yet. So the monks would write the Bible one at a time. They would copy it. They would copy the Bible. And then they would copy it again and copy it again and copy it again. Well, but the advantage was that the monks were the only ones that could read and write. The majority of the population they were not able to read and write. And that is one of the reasons, one of the reasons, there were many others, but one of the reasons the Middle Ages were also called the Dark Ages. They were called the Dark Ages. And they would call the Dark Ages because people were not educated enough. They weren't, not that they weren't naturally smart. Everybody has the capacity of being smart but such a high percentage of the population was illiterate. They didn't know how to write or read. It wasn't until much later in the 1700s and the 1800s that more that schools were developed and uh, people were able to learn to read and write. And then that percentage of people that were not able to read and write became smaller and smaller. Today, um, a lot of the more advanced countries have got a literacy rate of 99%. That means that 99% of the population can read and write. And there might be one percentage, a few people that either were too poor or something like that, and they never went to school and they never learned to read and write. But back in the dark ages or the middle ages, um, the author here calls it the dark ages, but uh, that's not really an academic term. The academic term is middle ages. Uh, the middle ages are called dark ages by some people. Uh, but back in the Middle Ages, the percentage was the reverse. 90, 95% of the population 
it's not able to read. Only maybe three, four, five, six percent of the population is able to read. So we take reading for granted, but it is so important. It is so important, right? It is such an important thing. It gives us freedom. Reading gives us freedom. Most of the books were about people. We tried to find some about rats, but there wasn't much. We didn't find a few things. There were two sets of encyclopedias that had sections on rats. From them, we learned that they were about the most hated animals on earth, except maybe snakes and germs. This is the bummer side of reading, right? If the rats hadn't ever learned to read, they would never even know that they were so hated. But on the other hand, at least they are winning against snakes and germs. Even though it is upsetting, the rats need this knowledge to survive. They sure do. The truth, and that's the other one, the truth will set you free. Because see, now they know the truth. They know that people hate rats. So now, they can be careful. They can stay away from humans or something, right? Books. Her husband, Jonathan, had told her about them. He had taught her and the children to read. The children had mastered it quickly, but she herself could barely manage the simplest words. She thought perhaps it was because she was older. Mrs. Frisbee still doesn't know yet that her husband and children are so quick to read because Jonathan has his DNA altered. She knows she is different than they are, but she comes to the wrong conclusion that she is just old. Still, though, it must mean that she is pretty smart if she can read at all without the super rodent DNA cursing through her body. Mechanized rats invade hardware store. This quote from the newspaper article about the dead rats in the hardware store is a dead giveaway to the rats that the folks from NIM are on the hunt for them, the reaction to it, that it doesn't quite make sense, also shows how skillful they are at reading and using logic. Not only can they read, they read words, but they can read into the deeper meaning behind those words. In a moment, his older son, Paul, came out, closing the door carefully behind him. Paul, at 15, was a quiet, hardworking boy, rather clumsy in his mo movements, but strong and careful about his chores. In a few seconds, he was followed by his younger brother, Billy, who at age 12 was noisy and had an annoying habit of skimming rocks across the gross at anything that moved. This is one of the- I think they spelled it wrong and it's supposed to be grass. Yeah, maybe, you're probably right. Uh, rocks across the grass, yeah, they spelled it wrong. The grass, actually, maybe even the water. Um, maybe, I don't know, you're probably right. Anyway, this is one of the few glimpses of the Fitzgibbons family life. It's important because it shows the Fitzgibbons as a family rather than an evil set of enemies. Of course, it also complicates matters because we mostly are asked to see them as enemies. Optimus, Optimus Timothy's mother 
if you're an Arthur and others in your group can take risks to save them, surely I can too. This mama is serious about protecting her babies. Her willingness to put herself at risk is impressive to the rats who begin to take her much more seriously after this declaration. As she hurried home, Mrs. Frisbee considered just how much she should tell her children about all that happened. She decided at this stage, at least, she would not tell them about their father's connection with the rats. This probably makes sense, given that Mrs. Frisbee does not know the full story about Nemo yet, and she is really stressed out about Timothy. But we wonder if it is fair of her to hoard secrets like this. Don't these kiddos deserve to know the whole story? What do you think? That's a very good question. That afternoon, Mrs. Frisbee told the children that she must leave them to confer again with the rats when she thought of the danger she would face in just a few more hours. She wanted to kiss them all goodbye. But knowing that Timothy, at least, was already suspicious, she did not dare. But told them only that they should not worry if she was a little late getting home for supper. Family is everything to Mrs. Frisbee, even when her life is in danger. She's focused on trying to make things easier for her children. A mother's love is priceless. Huh? They could stay in the house now as long as they needed to. On some warm day later in the spring, when Timothy was strong again, they could move to the summer house down by the brook. Yay for the Frisbees! But even though we're doing a total happy dance that the Frisbees get to keep their house, at the same time, we're biting our nails that the rats will have an equally happy outcome. The house could be theirs forever, thanks to the rats. One of the more lovable qualities that the animals in this novel share is that they always pay their debts to other characters. It's not surprising that Mrs. Frisbee would acknowledge that her good fortune is on account of the kindness of strangers. They walk through the summer house, taking half a day to do it, strolling slowly and enjoying the fine weather, stopping on the way to eat some new spring weather, stopping on the way to eat some new spring leaves of field crests. Holy irony, Batman. The warm weather terrifies the Frisbees earlier. And now they're having the time of their short lives in it. Amazing with some help from your neighborhood friendly super rats can do. Considering that the family was living in fear just a few days ago, the image of them strolling along outdoors shows how far they have come. In the garden, they were always along with themselves. But along the bank of the broken summer lived five of the mice families with their children. Given how close the family is, it doesn't seem like they would mind being alone with themselves. But Things seem great for the family now. New friends to play with, family all around, a waterfront view. But will these new mice see the frisbee kids 
as outsiders, as the other rats saw, the rats of Nim. To everyone's surprise, Timothy, Timothy says, I thought he might be. I think Mr. Ages was too. This is chiefly important because it shows for sure that Timothy got some of his dad's brains. He was thinking critically and making connections before he even knew about men. You know, thinking critically, wow, critical thinking. You know how important it is to think critically? Critical thinking is when you compare things and you decide which one is best. They teach you critical thinking in medical school. They do. They teach you how to look at a patient and decide what kind of an illness the patient is suffering from. That's part of critical thinking. They teach you critical thinking in business school because you need to make decisions on business. What is more profitable? What is going to be less profitable? Critical thinking is a very important aspect of us being successful at what we do. And perhaps this is one of the qualities, among many qualities, but one of the qualities that these rats have the ability to think critically. Okay, so we made it to the end, hooray. Now we know more about Mrs. Frisbee and the rats of Nim than anybody, right? Um, so it was really nice working with all of you. It was a lot of fun. And uh, again, as I say, we'll let you know when the next book, when we're ready for the next book. Um, it's going to be Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Now, the other one might be this other book that you guys uh, suggested here, which is uh, the one and only, the one and only Ivan. I got it right here in my cellular. So it might be this one, the one and only. Yeah, I think uh, end of February, probably, because again, um, I already have the wimpy kid. That one I already have. Uh, but if I if we decide to do the one and only Ivan, then I got to work on it. I got to read it first of all. I haven't read it. And I got to read it, and then I got to do a PowerPoint. And putting together a PowerPoint, you know, takes a little while. It takes at least a week to do it. So. Uh, Oh, the pages are really short. Well, that's good. That's good. That way I don't spend too much time reading it, but I'll try to put something together that's, uh, that's really cool. Okay, guys, boys and girls, it was a pleasure being with you. Also a book called A Long Walk to Water is very good. Oh yeah, I, I've heard of A Long Walk to Water. Let me see. Um, Give me a second here. Give me a second. I want to walk to water. Let me save this first. Let me save it. A long walk to water. A long. Yeah, I heard of that one. That one's a jungle book, isn't it? A long walk to water. Long walk to water. Um, long walk to water is a short novel written by Linda Sue Park and published in 2010. It uh, blends the two story of Salva Duck, whose story is based in 1985, a part of the Dinka tribe. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's a book about, as I say. You know, Africa, the jungle, kind of like a jungle thing. I've heard of this one. I haven't read it. Uh, this could be a possibility. I, again, I, I have to read it if I'm going to do something. 
but uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, we're going to make it fun. Um, we're going to make it fun. So until next time, see you later, alligator. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.